Reading from the Gospel of John in chapter 1. John's Gospel in chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light which gives light to every man coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness of him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And of his fullness we have all received, and grace for grace. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time. This, uh, the only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. Now this is the testimony of John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? He confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, What then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, No. Then they said to him, Who are you that we may give answer to those who sent us? What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now those who were sent were from the Pharisees, and they asked him, saying, Why then do you baptize if you are not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? John answered them, saying, I baptize with water, but there stands one among you whom you do not know. It is he who, coming after me, is preferred before me, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to, to loose. These things were done in Pithabra, beyond the Jordan, where John was baptizing. The next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who is preferred before me, for he was before me. I did not know him, but that he should be revealed to Israel. Therefore I came baptizing with water. And John, witnessing, uh, John bore witness, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and he remained upon him. I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, Upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and testify that this is the Son of God. Again, the next day, John stood with two of his disciples, and looking at Jesus as he walked, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. Then Jesus turned, and seeing them following, said to them, What do you seek? They said to him, Rabbi, which is to say, when translated, Teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, Come and see. They came and saw where he was staying and remained with him that day. Now it was about the tenth hour. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. 
He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which is translated the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Now when Jesus looked at him, he said, You are Simon, the son of Jonah. You shall be called Cephas, which is translated a stone. The following day, Jesus wanted to go to Galilee, and he found Philip and said to him, Follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him whom Moses, whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no guile, no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered and said to him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered and said to him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered and said to him, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Most assuredly I say to you, Hereafter you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Amen. May God bless the reading of his words. We're beginning a series of sermons this morning that will that we'll focus on the life of, of one man and God's dealings with him, a man who occupies something of a unique position in Scripture as a disciple, an apostle, and as a, an author of two New Testament epistles. I'm speaking, of course, of Simon Peter. Now, as you know, the Bible provides us with very much straightforward doctrine about Christian faith and the Christian life, about Christian experience and Christian obedience, and much more beside than that. That uh, doctrine, that teaching is systematized for us in the New Testament epistles and in various other ways uh, in, in the scriptures. But sometimes these great Bible truths and principles are more easily grasped and illustrated when we see them in the life of an individual, a person uh, perhaps with whom we may identify, someone who's been through trials that are similar to those that we experience and face problems the same as our own, whose life develops in ways that we can identify with and understand, and who, by God's grace, over time becomes an example of Christian discipleship. And my hope, then, in our studying the life of Peter together, is that we, too, will learn more and more what it is to be and become disciples, followers of the Lord Jesus. So, this morning, we'll look at the way in which Peter became a disciple of Jesus, looking at his, his calling, the way in which he was brought to Jesus, looking at the first signs of grace that were evident in his life. And to do that, we'll look at uh, John 1, verse 35 through 42, a passage that outlines for us the beginning of Peter's journey. So, John 1, 35. The next day, John stood with two of his disciples, and looking at Jesus as he walked, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. Then Jesus turned, and seeing them following, said to them, What do you seek? They said to him, Rabbi, which is to say, uh, which is to say when translated teacher, Where are you staying? He said to them, Come and see. They came and saw where he was staying and remained with him that day. Now it was about the tenth hour. One of the two who heard Jesus speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which is translated Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Now, there are three things in particular then that I want us to think about this morning and notice about the beginning of this work of grace evident in Peter's life. Uh, the, the background to the work of grace the instrument in this work of grace, the nature of this work of grace that, that marks the beginning of Peter's spiritual life. 
Evidently, it's important to see the background of the work of grace in his life because clearly uh, these were special days when God began to work in Peter. Throughout the whole land, it had become evident that something was happening. There was a spiritual awakening taking place as the Holy Spirit was stirring the hearts and minds of many people in the nation. And one of the most prominent indicators of that, of what the Holy Spirit was doing, was through the preaching of John the Baptist. That was the context in which Simon Peter is brought to Jesus Christ. The background to his coming to Jesus was the preaching and ministry of John. Verse 6, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness. That was the significance of John's ministry. He came to preach, to teach, to bear witness to the light coming into the world. So to gain a true picture of Peter's spiritual beginnings, you have to have some appreciation of the ministry of John the Baptist. Peter was brought to Jesus by Andrew, but Andrew was pointed to Jesus, quite literally, by John the Baptist. One of the marks of John's ministry was that he was always pointing people away from himself. He had come to prepare the way of the Lord. And it seems to me highly likely that at some time Peter himself must have been exposed to the ministry of John the Baptist and he heard his preaching. He experienced something of the power of God that was at work in John's ministry at that time. And I suspect that Andrew, who brought Peter to Jesus, must have previously taken him to John's uh, preaching ministry because uh, he himself, or before he uh, became a disciple of Jesus, Andrew himself was already a disciple of John the Baptist, we read in verse 35. So John was a man who proclaimed Jesus the Messiah in such a fruitful way and his ministry had three particular marks that we need to notice because they're so important to our understanding the beginning of Simon's, uh, Simon Peter's spiritual experience. John's ministry was self-effacing, it was Christ-exalting, and it was Bible-based. And these three things were particularly true of John's ministry, out of which this work of grace began in Simon Peter. As, as you read through John 1, which we read earlier, you see a stream of people finding their way to Jesus, one after another being brought to faith in Jesus Christ. And that all flows out of the ministry of John the Baptist. So let me clearly then, uh, or quickly, demonstrate these marks of John's ministry, his self-effacing, Christ-exalting, Bible-based ministry. It's not for nothing that most Christians remember John for his statement that Christ must increase and that he, John, must decrease. Because as we read the testimony of the New Testament to John the Baptist, you find consistently this concern in John for himself to be, as it were, taken out of the way, for him to get out of the way so that people might gaze and be taken up with Jesus. That's the dominant mark of his life and ministry. He's concerned for people to look at Jesus Christ. He must increase, he said. I must decrease. So far from drawing attention to himself, John the Baptist was always directing attention away from himself to Jesus Christ. That was the fundamental mark of John's ministry about a life concerning which Jesus said, of men born of women. There is none greater than John the Baptist. He is a burning and a shining light. Well, what made him a burning and a shining light? It was that he stood aside so that others might see Jesus. And so when men asked him, Who are you? He answered, I am not the Messiah. I am not Elijah. I am not the prophet. Well, then, who are you? And he said, I am a voice crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. A voice, just a voice. And the significance of the voice, of course, is that it is a vehicle of the truth. The proclamation of the truth, that's how John saw it. 
a voice crying in the wilderness. That's all. And we must always be aware then of the temptation to anyone involved in any kind of service for God. The temptation to draw attention to ourselves. It's a, it can be a very subtle thing. But it's one of the perils of serving God. That's why James in his epistle says, My brethren, not, let not many of you become teachers. Meaning teachers in the church, of course. Uh, James seemed to be putting barriers between men entering the preaching and the teaching ministry of the church because he saw the dangers that are connected with that. James and John the Baptist before him knew that there is a cost involved in serving Jesus Christ. Many deaths to die so that only Jesus may be exalted. Death to self. John every day died to self till he could say, I am a voice. Nothing else. That's all I am. I'm just a voice. A voice proclaiming the truth concerning Jesus. And that brings us to the second thing about his ministry, which was that it was a Christ-exalting ministry. No man has more exclusively exalted Jesus Christ than John the Baptist. Notice in verse 26 of chapter 1, we read these words. John answered them, saying, I baptize with water, but there stands one among you whom you do not know. It is he who, coming after me, is preferred before me, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to loose. He was constantly pointing to Jesus and his exalted glory. Verse 30, This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who is preferred before me, for he was before me. Verse 33, I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, Upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit, and I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. John's whole intention and motive focused on this one thing, that the Lord Jesus Christ must be set forth in all his unique glory and honour as the Son of God. And no greater privilege comes to anyone in this world. No greater honour can God bestow upon us than that our lives be like that, that we have this ambition in life to exalt the Lord Jesus Christ. Is that what drives you today? Is that your ambition? Is that what fires you and motivates you? The chief end of man, the reason why we exist, is to glorify God. Do we see life through that lens? Or is our life shaped more by the passing world? John was driven by this ambition to exalt Jesus Christ. He calls himself the, the friend of the bridegroom, the best man. And it's the business of a best man to serve the interests of the bridegroom. That's his role. And we wouldn't think much, would we, of a bridegroom at a wedding who just pushed himself forward and was hogging the limelight so that everyone focused their attention on, on the best man. No, his job is to serve the groom. It's the groom's day, not his. And for the time that God has given to us in the world, there's nothing of greater importance or significance so much as this. This is our highest calling in life, as it was John's, Christ-exalting ministry. But not only a self-effacing ministry and a Christ-exalting ministry, the main feature and characteristic of John's ministry is that it was a Bible-based ministry, Bible-centered. And by that I mean John spoke and he bore testimony out of the riches of Holy Scripture. You see in verse 23, it was the Scripture that shaped his own understanding of himself. He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. It was Scripture that shaped his understanding, not only of himself, but also of the Lord Jesus. Verse 29, 
The next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. What does John mean when he says those words that are so familiar to us? Well, he isn't just saying that Jesus is some quiet, lowly, gentle figure. John is saying much more than that. He's saying, if you want to understand Jesus, if you want to understand who he is and why he has come and what he's going to do, you've got to go to the Old Testament Scriptures. You've got to go to its message concerning a lamb slain to take away sin. John is saying, this is the Jesus I'm pointing to, the Jesus of Scripture. Because that phrase, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, encapsulates the whole of what the Old Testament is telling us about the coming Messiah. So John is saying, Jesus is the Lamb. Abraham told Isaac, his son, that God would provide such a lamb when they were on Mount Moriah. And John is saying, here is the lamb that Abraham said God would provide. This is the lamb which the Passover lamb in Egypt uh, was such a vivid picture and illustration. This is the lamb to which every morning and evening sacrifice in the temple uh, spoke so clearly. This is the lamb the prophet Isaiah spoke of when he said he will be led like a lamb to the slaughter and the Lord will lay upon him the iniquity of us all. Now that's the Jesus that John the Baptist preached to Andrew, the man who brought Peter to Jesus. And it will have been preaching like that that Peter heard when he went and spoke to him. Preaching like that would have gripped Peter's soul, because Peter was to go on later to write an epistle of his own. And you remember how he said, we have been redeemed, ransomed, not by ordinary things, cheap things, worthless things like silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without spot or blemish. It's this Jesus that John the Baptist came to preach, the biblical Jesus. Bishop Ryle, in his expository thoughts, writes like this. Let us take heed that in all our thoughts of Christ we think of him first as John the Baptist here represents him. Let us serve him faithfully as our master. Let us obey him loyally as our king. Let us study his teaching as our prophet. Let us walk diligently after him as our example. Let us Look anxiously for him as our coming redeemer of body as well of, as well as soul. But brethren, above all, let us prize him as our sacrifice and rest our whole weight in his death as an atonement for sin. Let his blood be more precious in our eyes every year we live. Whatever else we glory in about Christ, let us glory above all things in his cross. This is the cornerstone. This is the citadel. This is the root of all Christian theology. We know nothing rightly about Christ until we see him with John the Baptist eyes and can rejoice in him as the lamb that was slain. Now there's a reason for this biblical emphasis. And there's a reason why John introduces Jesus to us this way. It is because the great problems of this world, whether we speak about the personal problems of your own life or the domestic world that you occupy or the national world with all of its need or the international world with all of its dangers and problems, the real problem of the world is not economic or educational or political or religious The real problem lies in the heart of man. It is that he is a sinner living in rebellion against God and that the whole of our lives are consumed with self, self self-centeredness and self-interest. That's where the real problem lies. And God's answer to that problem, you see, is to provide one who will come and take that sin away. Your sin. And mine, to take it away. That's why this is so vital. A Jesus who is presented us to us in such a way that we only admire him 
as a great teacher, doesn't even begin to touch that problem, you see. Or a Jesus preached as the great example, that can only bring despair to men and women because we can't reach the standard that he has set. But the Jesus of Scripture who John preaches is a Jesus who deals with sin, who gets to the root of it and breaks it, its power and cancels its debt that we might be right with God. Now Peter came to discover that that's what he needed. He ran away from that truth for a long time. Even while he was following Jesus as a disciple, years passed before he discovered the deepest realities of this. Do you remember how he said on one occasion, Lord, though all men deny you, you can count on me. I'll never deny you. And within a day of saying that, he had to face the reality that he needed a saviour who would be the Lamb of God that would take away his sins. That's the ministry that ultimately gave birth to Simon Peter, a self-abasing, Christ-exalting, Bible-based ministry. We rightly long for another move of God in Wales, God's church being moved under the power of the Holy Spirit and people being brought to new life in Jesus Christ. Well, if in the grace of God we live to see such a day as that again in Wales, this will be the mark of the movement of God's Spirit in our land. There will be a self-abasing, Christ-exalting, Bible-based ministry. And if you pray for reviving of God's work in our land, that's what you need to pray for, a reviving of that. And this is such a need in our day, because everywhere today people are hearing sermons that are little more than self-help sermons that will help them get through the week and cope with the problems of this week or that will solve their economic or their physical problems. People are preaching a Jesus that we don't find in the pages of Scripture. John the Baptist's ministry was self-abasing, Christ-exalting, Bible-based. That's the background of the work of grace in Peter's life. Then quickly let's look at the instrument, the human instrument of this work of grace in Peter, which is Andrew, Peter's brother, verse, verse uh, 40. One of the two who heard Jesus speak and followed him, or John speak and followed him, that is Jesus, was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, we have found the Messiah, uh, which is translated the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Did you notice that this chapter is like a, a chain of findings? Andrew finds his brother. He says to him, we have found the Messiah. Verse 43, Jesus found Philip. Verse 45, Philip found Nathanael. That's a mark of grace. That's what happens, you see. Like eureka moments as men find the Lord Jesus Christ and are found by him. And men who find their brothers and bring them to Jesus. We have found the Messiah. Andrew was saying to Peter that this was the greatest discovery of life. This was like uh, discovering a, a precious, enormous, priceless treasure and going home bursting to tell your nearest and dearest, those who matter to you most, about your discovery. Matthew Henry writes that uh, true grace hates all monopolies and cannot abide to dine alone. True grace hates all monopolies, cannot abide to dine alone. Don't you see that in the New Testament scriptures? The woman at the well at, at Sychar in chapter 4 of John's gospel, having drunk the living water, runs to the city and says to everyone, come see a man who told me all things I ever did. Is not this the Messiah? I found him. Andrew found Peter and said, we've found the Messiah. He brings him to Jesus. That's how so many people are introduced, aren't they, to Christ. For me, it was my own mother. Prior to her conversion, the only place, well, not the only place, but the, the one memory I have of Mam taking me regularly was the Working Men's Club in Pont Newith on a Tuesday for family night. 
And then one night she came home and said she had found Jesus and Jesus had found her. And the next night she was taking me to chapel so that I should hear about Jesus too. Now bringing Peter to Jesus was for Andrew a physical thing. But it had spiritual implications for both Peter and Andrew. And for us. We bring, we bring men to Jesus through the quality of our lives. Over the years, I've seen more people brought to Jesus Christ by that means than by any other. People have worked alongside someone on the shop floor or in school or in an office or whatever, and they're struck by some quality in this person's life. And over time, they begin to wonder, what is it that sets this per person apart from others? Some of you came that way. Your interest was first sparked by the quality of another person's life. And it, it, it wasn't that you were attracted by some persuasive argument or some powerful argument, but a life changed by this Messiah. And we bring people to Christ through the faithfulness of our prayers. I don't know about Andrew here in this instance, but I know about this principle. Some of you have been brought to Christ through the burden prayers of others who have pleaded with God for you and that played a part in your being drawn to Jesus Christ. And we bring people to Jesus through dying. Dying a thousand deaths so that the life of Jesus might be seen in us. It's interesting that after this instant, incident Andrew largely disappears. He's barely mentioned except for the fact that he brings people to Jesus. In John 6, he brings a boy to Jesus with his lunch of loaves and fishes. Can you do anything with this boy and his lunch? In John 12, he brings certain Greeks to Jesus. And then he fades from the page of Scripture. Sometimes the greatest significance of a man's life is that he brings people to Jesus. That's all he's known for. What a wonderful thing to be known for. And then finally, the nature of the work of grace in Peter. What is its essence? What is it that God does in him by his grace? Verse 42. He brought him to Jesus. Now when Jesus looked at him, he said, You are Simon, the son of Jonah. You shall be called Cephas, which is translated a stone. Uh, Cephas is the Aramaic word for a rock. Petros is the Greek word for a rock. Petros, Peter. Verse 42 says that Jesus looked at him. The original word means to gaze with intensity. No doubt Andrew had told Peter about Jesus. And no doubt he had told Jesus about Peter. And now here he is bringing Peter to Jesus, and Jesus gazes at him. So, you are Simon, are you? In the flesh. Well, you will be Cephas, a rock. Now, what did that mean to Peter? Well, to any Jew familiar with the Scriptures, these words were designed to capture Peter's attention. As you know, in many instances in Scripture, a name is full of significance. Uh, often the name stood for what a person was. Often the name stood for a p person's, for parents' hopes. A name spelled a character, so a child's name indicated the parents' hopes for their child, for the sort of person he would be. Elijah, for example. Elijah, my God is Jehovah. His parents were living at a time when Everyone, everywhere, even in Canaan, in the Promised Land, were worshipping Baal. And very few had any clear-cut consecration for the living God. So at such a time to call your son Elijah was an expression, a real expression of hope. And often in Scripture, we see that when God lays his hand on someone's life, on a man, he gives him a new name. Not in the sense of the parent's expression of hope. Because you know how sometimes names can belie character. P 
parents' hopes are sometimes bitterly disappointed. But when God gives a new name to a life that he touches by his grace, God's hopes are sure hopes. When he calls Abram, Abraham. When he renames uh, Jacob, Israel. When he renames Gideon, Jerubal. He's not just giving a new name. He's giving a new character. And so when Jesus gazes at Peter and says, You are Simon. You will be a rock. That meant something. Because the last thing that Peter was like at this time was a rock. Peter is characterized, as you read through the Gospels, by instability and duplicity and unreliability and impetuosity. That's what Peter was like by nature as a man. Lord, though all these deny you, you can count on me. He didn't even know himself. And Jesus replied, Peter, tonight, before the cock crows three times, you will deny me. You will deny ever knowing me. Anything but a rock. But Jesus, you see, wasn't, wasn't speaking to Peter just about names, but Jesus was speaking about the depth of a real work of grace that was to take place in his life. What is, let me ask you, what is a real work of grace? What is that? What is it that happens when the grace of God invades a man's life and character so that Jesus speaks to him and uh, does a work in him? What, what is that? Jesus says, you are, this is what you are like, but you shall be. I'll tell you what it is. It's, it's the new birth. It is a new creation. It is the work of taking a man, taking a woman, whoever they are, dead in their sins, and raising them to new life in Jesus Christ. It is that that gives hope to people. And that's what thrilled Peter and made his soul sore. Uh, later on, he writes his first epistle, and in chapter 1 and verse 3, he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, by his great mercy, we have been born anew to a living hope. That's the work of grace. And you and I should not rest with anything less than that in our own experience. We shouldn't be con content with any religious experience that falls short of the new birth. This is where the real work of grace begins in a person's life. You are Simon. You shall be a rock. And we need to catch a gl glimpse then of what grace can do in our lives. For Peter, that transition from Simon uh, to the rock Peter, that transition, uh, transformation had many, many painful moments as the Lord Jesus chipped and chiseled away at his life, changing him so that he began to bear the image of Jesus in his own character. But the wonderful thing is this, that once Jesus had set about this change in Peter's life, he would not leave it unfinished. Having laid hold of him, he would not relinquish his grasp, he would not release his grip of Peter. And so through every experience, even through the night of tears and, and shameful denial, the Lord Jesus had this purpose in mind. He is going to be Peter. He is going to be the rock. My heart and hand is set to accomplish this in him. And that's what gives grace to everyone here this morning. Or should I say that's what gives hope to everyone here this morning. You may say... Well, it's great that that can happen to other people, but it can't happen to me. And I'm saying, if it happened to Simon, it can happen to anyone here this morning. This is what the work of grace really is. Right through your life in this world, God is never finished in his work of changing you. Isn't that good news to know this morning? Isn't that a wonderful truth to carry home with you today? 
God is never finished changing you in this world. Have you grasped that yet? You may have followed the Lord Jesus Christ ever so falteringly for many years, and you may have influenced many other people for good and been a great blessing to them. But the need for your life to be changed never comes to an end in this world. And God in Christ will always be at work in you, changing you into his likeness. And lastly, I am not Andrew, but I'd love to be an Andrew to you this morning. To bring you to Jesus and to show you something of his saving glory as the one who is able to reach down into the depths of your life and deal with your sin. You can come to him and you can find the same Lord Jesus Christ today. He's the same. Andrew's long gone. Peter's long gone. One day I'll be gone. One day we'll all be gone. Jesus will always be the same. And he can gaze at you today and knowing you through and through, he can say, so you are you will be. The Lord bless his word to us.